so yep, yeah, I'm an assistant professor for the Computing and New Media Technologies Department at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, but I'm also their information security officer uh, and uh, I'm an adjunct uh, lecturer, associate lecturer in the sociology and social work department teaching criminology courses. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about cybersecurity and society. It's going to be essentially a presentation on the way that uh, technology is integrated into our society and how that knowledge can help you to better affect cybersecurity strategies for your organization. I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm assuming you all can see that. So we are going to start at the very beginning. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, uh, the role that technology plays in society. Um, so essentially, uh, nothing is spawned from primordial chaos, not since the Big Bang. Uh, everything, all inventions are, of course, an intentional, deliberate process. And as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So uh, we have problems and we invent things to solve those problems. And uh, no matter how you cut it one way or another, the problems that technology solves are always involved with the concept of human work, the amount that we must expend, the resources we must expend in order to achieve some end generally, uh, one that is going to be in, in some way integral to our survival. So, for example, uh, if uh, we're talking about um, prehistoric humans, uh, they of course need water, they have a, a biological necessity for for water and water exists uh, directly on the surface of the earth in certain places, right? So they have a choice. Uh, they can uh, expend a lot of energy to go to the watering hole, which of course is a, a high, what they call transaction cost, right? We're expending a lot of labor in order to achieve that goal. Uh, but that endeavor also carries with it certain inherent risks, right? All animals need water, and that means that the uh, prey animals need it, which means that the predators will also be present because not only do they need the water, but they also need to eat the prey. So we can expend that energy and take that risk and get water and possibly get eaten in the process. Or we can evaluate that transaction cost with maybe a technological advancement like, for example, the well, right? Now that is uh, essentially expending a lot of energy, right? We have, that's a part of the transaction cost evaluation, uh, but also the risk inherent there uh, is we're, we're trading the risk of predation uh, for the risk of, uh, of an unfruitful endeavor, right? We may, we may potentially expend that energy and not end up with water at the end. So these are the evaluations that we conduct some, most of the time, even subconsciously, right? Among uh, human beings uh, all the time. Um, how much human work does it take to get what we want? Now the evaluation, or, or I should say the ways that technology can support that work is three essential methods. There's supporting, supplementing, and enhancing. Now all of those may seem like synonyms, but we'll define those in a moment. But essentially that's what the transaction cost comes down to. How does the technology play into that human work? So brass tacks, uh, technology exists because human beings are very good at certain things. And those two things boil down generally to things that are creative and cognitive. And we invent things to help support the things that we are less good at, right? Uh, no human being is, is, is built necessarily for repetitive tasks. We can we do those because they are in terms of a transaction cost worth the effort. But in the end, it's almost always better favorable in terms of the eventual cost of human work to invent something to do those tasks that we can focus on the creative and the cognitive. Or essentially, technology exists. We think, therefore, it is, to borrow a phrase from Descartes. So supporting, supplementing, and enhancing, uh, what are the differences uh, of those? Um, I'm going to use uh, the assembly, the design and assembly of a car for this analogy, but just bear in mind that this could apply to essentially any technological advancement, right? So when we say that technology supports our lives, what we're talking about is a technology that is developed to improve the efficiency of human work. It allows us to do things uh, better, faster, more efficiently. So uh, in the process of designing a car before the advent of computers, uh, it required uh, hundreds and hundreds of drafts, lots of drawings, physically building models, uh, building prototypes, and all of this is still done, but the scale upon which it's, it's needed at this point, uh, thanks to computer technologies, is, is su supported by this process, right? We can now model cars in 3D, rotate them in virtual space. We can adjust diagrams and drafts in AutoCAD on the fly. We can simulate certain safety 
safety features in virtual space without having to build prototypes or have a pretty good idea of how the prototype will operate before it's physically built. When we say that technology supplements our lives, what we're talking about then is the process of actually assembling the car, which used to take quite a lot of people to do. Um, the actual technological advancement that Henry Ford advanced wasn't the automobile itself that had already been invented, but the assembly line. Prior to that, an individual who wanted to assemble a car needed to know how to assemble a car. After that, a person only needed to know how to assemble part of a car. It still required a lot of people and quite a bit of human work, but eventually technology advances. And as you can see in the uh, images to the, the left, uh, very few people are, are now involved directly in that process. Now we need people who know how to design, maintain, program robots who they know how to assemble the car. So the human beings in that case, taken out of the equation. That's supplementing human work. And finally, enhancing human work. That's when technology allows us to do things uh, that would otherwise be impossible. And uh, going back to the car analogy, for example, um, backup cameras or GPS, right? Of course, we can back up a car without a backup camera. We've been doing it for quite a long time already. But what we can't do without that technology is see into that blind spot. It's just impossible. Um, in terms of GPS, uh, we can, of course, navigate without a GPS. We can use map and compass, but those themselves are technological advancements. And those are advancements that uh, improve upon navigating by stars, which is itself a technological advancement. So what we can't do without GPS is navigate long distances in unfamiliar territory without the stars or without any other inherent landmarks to guide us. Now, at the moment, the majority of the technology that we experience is in the realm of enhancing and supporting human work. But we are just now on the cusp of a new age where technology is going to primarily be designed to supplement human work. Uh, right now, we are just getting to the point where within our lifetimes, um, most likely mine, most likely yours, uh, we're going to have uh, autopilot for, for automobiles. Here you see is a, a smart egg carton um, that... <laughs> that uh, will uh, send you a message to your smartphone to let you know that you're running low on eggs and you need to pick it up. And this is, this is not science fiction, this is today, but someday in the not too distant future, there's uh, gonna be a human being who spends all day working on some endeavor, uh, probably some kind of cognitive endeavor or creative endeavor, um, and will get in their car who will drive them home. They'll receive a message that somebody's at the door and they'll be able to see that it's grandma because they can look through the camera on their phone and carry on a conversation while the car is driving them home. The car will schedule its own oil changes and the refrigerator will send a message that you're low on eggs and, and milk and that it's placed an order and some will be delivered later. Right? This is a, a whole new world that we're gonna be entering. Uh, we're also at a point now uh, where security is itself a service, but these services that are being developed as part of this new technology paradigm um, are not themselves necessarily secure. Um, there's a, a conversation no, that's not, just not part of the mm -hmm. conversation. It's not built with security in mind. They're built with services in mind. Or in short, we use technology to solve problems, even problems that are caused by technology or exacerbated by technology. Uh, and that includes the aforementioned failure to consider security in the design of these services. We expect that we'll just invent a technology in terms of security that will protect us. So what problem of human work does modern technology solve? Well, with computers, that's easy. It's right in the name, computers, they compute. Human beings, again, good at creative and cognitive, not so good at computation, doing a lot of processing all at once, um, retaining or recalling information perfectly. And so we invent technology, the computer, to do those things for us, we hope. Uh, the internet, what does that solve, is a little bit harder, a little bit more nebulous, and the answer uh, to that, I find, is best. I know it's bad form to answer a question with a question, but if you're going to answer what problem of human work does the internet solve, the, really the best answer is to consider what Ben Franklin once said, what good is a newborn baby? So I don't want to uh, venture into the area of Evo Psych or anything like that. So if you just bear with me for a moment, we'll take some things for granted. Uh, first, that uh, if a creature is to survive, and this is in the Darwinian survival of the fittest sense, uh, then it logically they would need to develop their primary survival mechanism as soon as possible, right? So those creatures that do that are able to survive uh, uh, longer or at least more successfully and pass on their genes. And there we have uh, you know, a sense of modern evolution. 
Uh, we see this, uh, some examples, you know, for a foal, when a baby horse is born, it can run mere hours after birth, right? That is the primary survival mechanism of a horse. Some creatures can fly, some have shells or spikes, but human beings, we don't have any of those things. Uh, we, we don't have, we don't secrete a poison. Uh, and uh, the uh, survival advantages that we have that most people would point to, like our opposable thumbs, sure, that gives us a lot more versatility in tool use, which is very helpful, but babies don't have any fine motor skills and they don't develop those for quite a long time. Um, our advanced brains, right? Uh, more advanced cerebral cortex, a decision-making process, executive functioning. Again, babies can't do that. Uh, not for quite a long time do they develop those skills. So what good is a newborn baby? What can we do? What do we do mere moments after birth? Uh, the answer is cry. We cry, babies cry all the time. And uh, I, I consider that to be our primary survival mechanism, right? The expectation, uh, even inherent, innate, um, uh, that we can cry out uh, for help and expect that other human beings will come and aid us. Or in short, communication is our primary survival mechanism. All of our greatest technological advancements are around the area of communication. The spoken word, the written word, the printing press, um, the telegraph, the telephone, uh, the mail service, all of these are, are some of our greatest technological advancements. And all of them speak to communication, improving it in some fashion. The internet is, at least for the moment, uh, the ultimate evolution of that trajectory of technological advancement. Uh, the internet in its invention uh, essentially provides a rock bottom transaction cost for communication. So if you consider uh, way, way back before there were very many uh, t technological advancements in communication uh, to ancient Greece, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the marathon as a race, 26.2 miles, but you might not be familiar with the story, uh, which is perhaps apocryphal, but I'll tell it anyway, um, of where that comes from. So uh, the story goes, it was uh, the Athenians facing the Persians invading at Marathon in Greece. Um, they and the Spartans had an alliance, and so they sent a messenger, of course, back then, uh, no telephones, no radios. If they wanted to send a message, they had to either write it down um, or send a messenger. Either way, the message had to physically be present with the recipient in order for it to be read. So they send Pheidippides a message. They say, go to Sparta, tell them that the Persians have landed and we need help. So Pheidippides runs 250 miles or thereabouts to the city-state of Sparta and says, the Persians are here, they need help. The Spartans say, Sure, we'll help, but we're celebrating right now, so we'll see you in a couple of days. Pheidippides runs 250 miles back to Marathon to relay the message to the Athenians, who, in the intervening uh, days, had actually won the battle. And so they said, Pheidippides, now you need to run to Athens in order to deliver this message, uh, because the Senate was about to put to a vote, essentially capitulating or surrendering to the, to the Persians. Uh, let the Senate know that we won and not to do this. So he runs the 26.2 miles from Marathon to Athens to deliver the message. He does, and then uh, dies immediately uh, of exhaustion afterwards. That's a very high transaction cost for communication, as important as it was. The internet, it makes that much easier. Uh, if Adipides could have picked up a phone and dialed, that's an even lower transaction cost, but if he could have just pulled out a smartphone and tweeted it to the entire world, uh, even lower transaction cost. Uh, date displacement, right? We already had that with the invention of the written word in the book. You know, words can survive thousands of years to be read by modern people. Um, but uh, now with uh, the internet, we have uh, the ability to communicate instantaneously across the, the world, across time zones, and, and essentially uh, everything uh, theoretically that's posted to the internet can be archived indefinitely. And perhaps the most significant is the decentralization of the publishing authority. Uh, so this was a huge revolution, and uh, and it led to the demise of a lot of previous publishing authorities. Um, what we're talking about here is prior to the internet, if you had something that you felt was worth hearing, you had to convince the right people that what you had to say was worth publishing. So you had to go to an editor or a producer or something like that and say, I have this message. They would have to agree and then put their publishing authority behind it to disseminate that message out to a lot of people. Well, now you can publish any stupid idea you have to the entire world in essentially an instant, uh, which is why we saw uh, the decline of a lot of traditional print media and such with the rise of the internet. It was their, their role in the information seeking and disseminating process had somewhat been undermined by this decentralization of their publishing authority, right? 
Um, so we use our ability to communicate in a lot of different ways. Um, although looking at the, the internet these days might lead you to believe that all we do is share cat pictures and memes and stuff. That's part of it. Uh, but we actually use uh, this, this ability to communicate in a lot of different ways. So here's a, a little bit of a, a chart here that I like to show uh, that kind of demonstrates all of this. So for example, uh, we have the average person uh, who now uh, will engage with virtual space, right? These uh, you go out on the internet and they will um, engage with the political process. It is our modern public forum, right? They'll express their opinions, uh, what's important to them, how they're suffering. Um, the ruling elites will also engage in that same space in order to sort of uh, get an idea of what the populace is, uh, is looking for, uh, what their agenda should be, uh, who their detractors are, and of course, disseminate their message, whatever that happens to be, right? So we have an actual real life agenda being set by what happens in virtual space. We also use that same space to engage in markets, right? So we do our online shopping there. We engage with our entertainment infrastructure there. Um, you know, people these days, they expect uh, the way the way that entertainment is consumed in modern times is, is completely different from the way it used to be consumed. There's different expectations by consumers in terms of entertainment these days. Um, sort of everything is expected to be on demand, right? And, and you know, if you have to sit through a commercial, right, you consider canceling your subscription to the streaming service because people don't sit through commercials anymore, right? Uh, it's also, you know, uh, where a, a lot of uh, economics takes place, right? And these have real world ramifications. Even if you choose not to engage in the political infrastructure, the public forum, or the uh, the online marketplace, uh, if even if you intentionally don't participate in those, it will still have an impact on you, right? Amazon is the largest company in the world right now. They the, What they do impacts the entire market space. So uh, if you don't choose to shop, shop on Amazon, that's fine, but it's still going to affect um, you know, the availability of goods or the price of goods. Um, if you don't go on Twitter, it doesn't matter if the president sends a tweet, it's going to affect the stock market or it's going to affect uh, agenda setting and legislation and, and that kind of thing, judicial uh, uh, functions of our, our government as well. Um, because all of this is taking place uh, in an overarching sort of system of um, information sharing, dissemination, and socializing, which is the primary function of human communication and therefore the primary function of, uh, of the internet. Uh, we now have a, a culture that is affected by all of these virtual spaces. So uh, I don't want to give the impression that uh, that there's a problem with any of this. There's there's really not. It's the evolution of a technology. It's a trajectory that started long ago when the first word was created. It's just it's taken quite a long time to get here. So uh, a lot of the the problems that we see or that are pointed to with with this technology, um, I would just would like to highlight that it's uh, it's not new, right? As we improve the efficiency of a system, we will improve the efficiency of flaws in that system. So if you think about it like uh, uh, if you, when you were a kid, you had your, your bike, if you ever put a card in the spokes of the bike, right, to give it that uh, motorcycle sound or something like that. Well, of course, uh, the slower the wheels turn, the less frequent the clacking noise. The faster you go, the more frequent the clacking noise. We're just improving the efficiency. It's the speed at which things are happening, and that allows the speed of, of flaws, right, to increase as well. So for example, it's a function less of the technology and more of other social factors like economics. And the best uh, description of this, the best example I can give you is with news dissemination or information seeking. So uh, these days we deal with what's known as clickbait and fake news. We hear about it all of the time. But these aren't new phenomena. And it's a matter of economics more than anything else, because prior to any technological advancements in computer technology, long, long ago, um, during the Industrial Revolution, our agrarian farmer ancestors were moving into urban city centers in order to take advantage of the new economic paradigm of industrialization. That meant that there were a lot of individuals, this is prior to in, uh, the auto industry really taking off. So most people are traveling by foot or bike or public transportation. And that meant that it was economically viable to have newspaper boys on the street corner shouting headlines, trying to draw people in to buy uh, newspapers, right? Extra, extra, read all about it. And then whatever more salacious the headline, the more people would be interested in coming by a paper. So there's an incentive to have salacious headlines. They called that yellow journalism back there. We call it clickbait. 
After World War II, uh, when people began to leave urban centers and move out to the suburbs, well, it was no longer economically viable to have uh, paper boys on the street corner selling papers. Instead, um, it became more economically viable to have subscriptions, right? A paper boy would deliver your paper to you. Uh, but then you're de-incentivized in that case to have salacious headlines because you don't want to publish anything that would be offensive to your readers and cause them to cancel their subscription. So instead you publish feel-good stories or you focus on getting exclusives, right? If you're the only paper with a story, then people are more likely to buy your paper. We call this the era of the scoop or scooping, and today we call it fake news. These aren't new. They're just the same old thing over again. It just happens to be that with technological advancements, the system is efficient enough uh, that both economic models are viable and incentivized in the system. And that's hardly the only problem really um, that we, we have uh, that crop up with, with these new efficiencies and systems, right? Um, as people are engaging with the political and the economic and the cultural social process <clears throat> in these online venues, it exacerbates other existing problems. Like for example, uh, inequality, uh, right? So if, uh, if before it was difficult to get a job unless you had a phone and that's a financial barrier uh, to social mobility, well, uh, now you, if you, you go into a McDonald's or an Arby's and you say, I need a job, they're going to say, well, go to our website and apply. And it only exacerbates the existing issue because that means that there is a technological and financial barrier to, to social mobility that's you know, uh, now tied to a different technology, essentially. So while most people are walking around with a terminal to the internet in their pocket 24 seven, well, if you don't have access to that technology or, or you know, the financial means to achieve it, well, maybe you have to walk three miles to a public library in order to check your email. That puts you at a distinct disadvantage. And this is only exacerbated by the technology, not caused by it. Um, you know, other issues like, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, so if you've heard of uh, Orwell's 1984, the idea was that there was going to be a totalitarian government that would uh, control what information was or was not disseminated to the public, right? So censorship. Um, and there were, even, even today you'll hear people saying, you know, this is Orwellian or, or something like that. But that's not really where we ended up. Where we ended up is actually closer to a different work uh, by Aldous Huxley called um, A Brave New World, where instead it's another dystopian novel, but instead uh, there's so much information that people can't possibly separate the signal from the noise. Um, you know, there's, uh, they, they can't tell what's truth or what's false or what's, uh, you know, what's um, uh, valid or invalid or, or anything like that. And that's kind of where we're at because there's so much information out there now uh, that we can't possibly, even if we wanted to, we can't possibly ingest all of this information that we're inundated with all the time. So we have to self-select our sources. And there's two primary motivating factors in human behavior, the pursuit of comfort and the avoidance of discomfort. So of course we would avoid or tend to avoid uh, places that disagree with our opinions uh, or, or challenge our worldviews. So that leads to exacerbating. This was always a problem before the internet, of course, of course, now that we have more better access to these other outlets. Um, so, um, you know, it just exacerbates that problem of echo chambers, right? Or basically, again, brass tacks, uh, the increased efficiencies of a system increase the flaws in the system and give new ways for bad people to do bad things or good people to do dumb things. And this is anecdotal. This is my experience as a cybersecurity professional. But the way I see it is uh, uh, part of the problem is that uh, as a discipline, uh, cybersecurity professionals tend to see um, human beings as part components of a security system. But... Um, uh, that's, I think, uh, 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 the wrong way to approach it because security is, is not a technical problem. We, we use technology in cybersecurity, of course, to provide, uh, you know, to cover security, to mitigate security risks. That's, of course, the name of the game. Uh, but security is always ultimately a human problem. And uh, it's always been the case, right? So even way back when, you could have, uh, you know, medieval times, you could have the thickest, um, most advanced gate um, but if a guard fell asleep on watch or if somebody lost the key or something like that, it, it meant nothing. It's still the same problem. It's still a human problem. So we approach uh, humans as a components in a system, but there's a problem in that we can't patch humans. We can't patch them out of the system. Humans are required at some point in order to do some form of human work, even if it's just a creative or cognitive process. Um, but we can teach them, right? Right but we approach that as patching. Uh, we know that humans are a weakness in the system, but we don't acknowledge the root of that problem, 
right? Instead, we will just, you know, sit there with our, you know, uh, just face palm with our head in our hands and we'll say in less than charitable terms, you know, some kind of sardonic phrase like, why did they respond to this fish? You know, how obvious is this kind of a thing? So what it comes down to in terms of patching humans, teaching them, training them, uh, is, uh, is that it tends to be not very effective. And part of it is that approach to human beings as uh, being components in a system rather than, than examining their behavior. Um, and the problem with that is that there's, human behavior is really complicated, all right? It's, it's really hard. Um, it's kind of paradoxical. In aggregate, human behavior is shockingly predictable, uh, but as individuals, uh, not so much. Um, what it comes down to is uh, sort of a, a parable I like uh, that's the, the meme that you see here, right? On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? You have a, a completely separate persona uh, online. You have a digital persona. And in, in uh, real world, you have many personas, right? Um, whenever you've had to maybe do that exercise uh, as, a, as a student, maybe the teacher asks you to write down like five traits you have. Well, some people have a lot of, lot of trouble with that. And the, the reason is because, you know, we're kind of many things. And sometimes the traits that we have are contradictory in different situations, right? So maybe, uh, maybe as an employee, I'm patient um, and empathetic, but maybe when I go home and hop on Xbox Live, I'm not patient and I'm callous and mean. I'm not saying I am, I'm just giving you an example. Um, well, that's normal, right? These are called behavioral schema. We behave differently in different situations. Um, and that's because it's a coping mechanism. It's a mental construct, a framework that we use in order to sort of guide our behavior, right? Uh, it helps us when we find ourselves in a new situation. So if I, if I have an employee schema, well, if I find myself in a similar situation, actually, let's do a better one for this example. Let's say I have a professor schema, right? So I have a certain way of behaving while I'm being a professor, and that's based upon how I've developed that schema, right? Um, if I have a, a similar situation, like presenting at a conference, which is similar but not exactly the same, well, I can take my professor schema and I can apply it to this and everything is just fine. My behavior in that situation is known as a persona. Now, let's say that I don't have a behavioral schema, right? I have a professor schema, but I can't apply it to speaking at a conference. Well, then I might develop a maladaptive persona, right? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll clamp up and I'll get really nervous or I'll say something inappropriate or, or something like that. Well, we have similar personas in all situations. There's employee personas, friend personas, child personas, parent personas, gamer personas, that kind of thing. Well, the problem with training is that we approach people as components in a security system and we approach training, therefore, as a work task or a compliance check mark, right? A lot of uh, compliance uh, uh, requirements, uh, be they regulatory or contractual, have training requirements, but we approach it as, as a technical problem, a technical challenge. And the efficacy of that is kind of questionable. It really kind of depends on the situation. Uh, for example, it's more effective in cases where we're talking about like maybe in the military, right? The military is famous um, for its cybersecurity training and it's famous for being uh, relatively effective, but uh, its efficacy, I, I would I would say is because the fact that soldiers have a soldier persona that's expected to be worn all the time, or at least whenever performing their official duties, right? Uh, a soldier is expected to be a soldier even when they're not in uniform, right? There's certain standards of conduct that they're expected to uphold. Well, that's not true for Jerry in accounting. If you give Jerry in accounting a 30 minute video and a 10 question quiz, um, sure, he'll pass, but that's not really going to be effective when he's in a different persona, right? Because we have sometimes we have contradictory traits in our persona. Sometimes we're outgoing, sometimes we're shy, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes we're patient, sometimes we're not, you know, depends. Um, which is why we see if approaching human beings more as human beings rather than components in the security system, that it's more effective to provide them training in a way that challenges or circumvents their work persona or whatever the circumstances they happen to be uh, being trained under. Um, so uh, this is uh, particularly important because, uh, for example, right now we're in the middle of a global pandemic and we're hosting this, uh, this conference virtually and a lot of people are working from home, which means that we have now more than ever a blending of work and personal life, which you know, causes problems. So you can have somebody's work persona trained, but if they're at home and they're also juggling a baby and stuff, they're more likely to make mistakes because their personas are shifting all over the place and they're feeling frazzled as a result.
So that's why gamifying training, for example, tends to be more effective, right? Because that's not something we do at work, right? So challenging their, their, their schema and, and causing them to, to, um, uh, to have their, their persona be more malleable, less, less set so that they can work in these new skills. All right, now I'd like to shift gears really quick and I'm very quickly running out of time, so I'm going to hurry through this, but I would like to talk about also what makes bad apples, what makes people do bad things and, and how is that important? Uh, how can that be uh, best served for your organization? I'm going to talk about three uh, criminological theories in this case, about general strain theory, space transition theory, and routine activities. They're all pretty simple, so it should be pretty quick. So with general strain theory, what we're talking about uh, is this was uh, a theory that was advanced by the Roberts, Agnew, and Merton. And um, essentially it's, uh, you know, human beings are under certain strains and those strains will motivate certain behavior. For example, um, strains that are seen as unjust, right? So um, someone is written up for something that they don't feel like is their fault or strains that are high in magnitude. And this is, I, I like to use the uh, Holmes and Rahi stress inventory for this. So if there's been a divorce or a death or a change in job title or a demotion, uh, those are strains that are high in magnitude. Uh, strains that are associated with low social control, right? So if you're, if you're passed up for a promotion by somebody who has less seniority and you perceive to be less qualified, uh, that signals to you as an individual that you're in a situation where the social rules, the order of meritocracy are sort of up in the air and, um, you know, low social control. The, the rules no longer apply, so why should you follow them kind of a situation. And then last, uh, strains that create a pressure or incentive to engage in criminal coping, like being heavily in debt or falling in with a bad crowd. Now, all of these uh, strains can cause an individual to engage in that criminal coping. Or basically, your uh, individuals will have, uh, have some kind of contact with your organizational and experience some kind of organizational injustice, which leads to negative emotions like anger, frustration, and fear. Two primary motivating factors of human behavior, pursuit of comfort and avoidance of discomfort. And this is a discomfort, uh, this is an uncomfortable state. This is discomfort. And so there's a lot of different coping uh, strategies that someone could engage in to alleviate that discomfort. Some of them are maladaptive, like uh, becoming an alcoholic or um, sandbagging at work, right? If I'm going to pass for that promotion, I'm just, I'm going to do the bare minimum. Sometimes that is criminal in nature, like uh, um, selling uh, proprietary uh, secrets to uh, a rival corporation, for example. Um, so uh, some examples of this uh, for the, the 2018 Tesla leak where um, an individual uh, was passed up for a promotion, right? And so leaked sensitive proprietary information or the 2014 Morrison leak, where an individual uh, faced a disciplinary hearing and so leaked the employee database. So lessons for you and your organization as far as general strain theory goes is you should be mindful of how organizational changes impact individuals, even if they're not directly affected by that change, right? Strain is a function of perception. If an individual in a similar job role gets fired for something, well, even if another individual of that organization in the same role wasn't affected by that, they're going to be able to sense that they're in a similar situation. Um, a lot of organizations will intentionally, for example, do firings on Friday in order to minimize a confrontation or limit contact with the individual. And, and that's you know, perhaps based upon some decent principles, but it's not a universal rule, right? Some individuals, if they're fired on a Friday, may feel even more wronged because they're feeling like, you know, maybe um, there's an injustice. Uh, there were secrets being told behind their back. They didn't have an opportunity to defend themselves or something like that. Uh, space transition theory is a good one that explains why Jerry in accounting is, uh, is perfectly normal and nice while at work. And then when he gets home, he switches behavioral schemas and then uh, gets online and starts uh, hurling racial epithets at 12 year olds on Xbox live. Essentially, um, we're in a different place, right? Uh, the, the, the transfer uh, from the physical world to the virtual world, there are different rules. And uh, while we have physical checkups for a lot of people in the United States, we don't have mental health checkups. So there's probably a lot of people wandering around with subclinical or undiagnosed, maybe access B personality disorders. Um, now, we don't necessarily know that, so we don't use those terms. Instead, we use the terms uh, of behavioral traits, in this case, dark tetrad traits. Right, individuals who are experiencing some low grade or undiagnosed psychopathy or sadistic tendencies or narcissistic tendencies uh, that when 
They find themselves in a virtual environment where there is identity flexibility, relative anonymity, uh, lack of oversight, and a conflict between what is considered acceptable in real life and what is acceptable online. Uh, they tend to engage in criminal behaviors, right? That is, uh, if you remove all consequence from an individual, uh, then you'll see truly uh, you know, what they're like. A uh, problem with this also is what's known as solipsism syndrome, which is a really fascinating um, uh, mental construct that I, I wish I had time to get into. But essentially, um, there are certain markers that uh, that define online interactions like perceived anonymity, uh, permanence, and constant connectivity, and the de-individualization of other, indi in other individuals online uh, that can cause an individual to sort of have their actions feel less real online. Right? That's space transition theory. And your lessons from that, essentially, that a person's behavior may be different online than it is in person, right? If there's no consequence in the absence of consequence, you might find a person's true nature, right? So if you're at an organization and you say, well, this person could never do this, uh, you know, you suspect maybe there's some uh, intrusion detection and you suspect that an individual's account may be involved and you're leaning towards it being compromised rather than it being misused. Well, consider at least for a moment the possibility that it is that individual because just because you know them in person doesn't mean that their behavior online is going to necessarily match up one to one. Uh, which is why, number two, uh, maintaining accountability in your environment is critical, right? Every individual's actions must be prescribed to them. Uh, another interesting thing about this, which uh, again, I don't really have time to get into, but um, is really fascinating for the future is that uh, there are some preliminary indications that uh, using techniques like stylometry and behavioral analytics, uh, that an individual's intent can actually be measured online through their behavior. Uh, finally, routine activities theory, which is very simple uh, and applies very well to, to computer crimes and computer criminal behavior. It's very simple. Again, this is uh, and, uh, Robert Agnew. Uh, so uh, three things must exist in the same time at the same place in order for a crime to occur. If one of these three things is missing or present, um, it can't happen. Those three things are a motivated offender, a suitable victim, and the absence of a capable guardian. Now, this is a great theory because it doesn't prescribe uh, any uh, motive, right? It just kind of takes for granted that there is, there, there will be motivated offenders. If there is something valuable, someone for some reason somewhere will want it and will maybe uh, uh, undergo criminal behavior to obtain it. So we still look for motive means opportunity and modus operandi, of course, a motivated offender, but essentially an individual who's in the right place at the right time, right? So a target of opportunity uh, or who has the technical capability and the motivation to victimize somebody. The capable guardian is the cybersecurity professional or the organization in general, right? That's a person that has been put in place to deter offenders from victimizing suitable targets or in case of a cybersecurity professional, your principal. And that is your suitable victim, right? So somebody who either presents an opportune reward, uh, so low hanging fruit, a uh, target of opportunity, or is what we call a uniquely attractive target. So a, uh, a principal that has, like for example, Sony, uh, they, they, when the Game of Thrones uh, season, I think it was seven was leaked, well, they're the only ones with Game of Thrones season seven, they're the only ones with access to it. So that's a uniquely attractive target for somebody who would seek to target that data. So the name of the game essentially is uh, you can't prevent motivated offenders from existing, right? We should just take that as a given. Motivated offenders will be out there. But if you are a capable guardian or if you're the suitable victim, your job then becomes ensuring that the motivated offender never comes into contact with the suitable victim, at least not without the presence of a capable guardian being known. And so uh, this is uh, another thing I find at least anecdotally to be often overlooked among cybersecurity professionals is we are constantly worried about our principles being socially engineered, but we never really reverse socially engineer or counter social engineer, right? Um, so for example, if you publish your security uh, policies online, and I think that you should uh, make them available to the public, put a date on them and make sure that they're updated all the time. Right? Never let more than six months go without at least changing that date. It's the same sort of uh, idea as having signs up to deter people from you know, doing illegal things in an area. Like you can put up a sign that says there's video cameras monitoring you without actually buying or hooking up any cameras. You can have a sign that says that there's an armed guard that will respond to an alarm system and not have an alarm system or an armed guard. They will still deter motivated offenders uh, because unless they're a uniquely attractive target, they'll be seen as less suitable right? They're, they're not low-hanging fruit at that point. So counter-social engineering, put, 
put it out there. Make sure that everyone knows that there's a capable guardian that's watching, even if you don't have the resources to actually watch everywhere all the time. So why I always recommend using the, um, the banner features, for example, for Windows logon, it says, you know, you're now logging onto a server, your behavior is being monitored. You know, uh, it's not there for people who are meant or allowed to be using the server. It's for people who aren't, right? It shows them that somebody is watching, even if you're not necessarily. So you should always be projecting an image of a competent, capable guardian wherever possible, whenever possible, right? Both internally and externally. And also uh, make sure that you, if you're following a security framework, uh, that you take into account the suitability of your principle, right? Because security frameworks are best practices. They don't consider things like criminological uh, elements or victimology or, or anything like that. One last note here um, on theories. Uh, is that no one is going to, there's no one universal theory of cybercrime or, or one universal theory, uh, sociological theory that binds all human behavior in a computer system. Um, but usually if you combine a couple of them, you can get a pretty, a much better, more comprehensive picture of what's going on. So for example, uh, an individual who's under strain and working overtime, that's general strain theory, right? Even if they're a team player and they're putting in extra hours, uh, resentment can build. Um, somebody like that who frequently sees company policy being violated by others, which is a different theory we didn't have a chance to talk about, broken windows theory, that individual is far more likely to engage in deviant or criminal behavior if the opportunity to, to do so presents itself, routine activities theory, in a place disassociated from their identity, space transition theory. Uh, so that was uh, my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Here's my contact information. I do, I do love talking about this stuff. So, you know, if you uh, have any questions or you just want to talk or chat or something like that, uh, please do reach out. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about this. Um, and uh, I understand a lot of you probably came from the, uh, the lunch talk about the MS and cybersecurity. If you have any questions or interest in that, I'm also happy to talk with anybody about that as well.